being organized by the IQAC of ARST College in collaboration with the Ministry of Education's PMM NMTT Teaching Learning Center, Ramanujan College, University of Delhi. On behalf of the organizing committee and 200 above participants who have joined us from far and near and overseas, I, Dr. Shubha Devedi, extend a hearty welcome to our distinguished scholar for today, who will be sharing her views on a very pertinent subject, folklore canonical issues in the post-structural context. And friends, it's my distinct honor and privilege to introduce you to Professor Nandini Sahu, who is a well-known creative writer, a folklorist, and one of the best-selling authors on Amazon and a distinguished scholar. And as Mr. Fonso Ladaki uh, said, an absolutely delightful person indeed, and uh, that is endorsed by her students also, who find her extremely patronizing and loving and supporting. So uh, more about her uh, charming personality. Ma'am wears several hats and she does it well. So before we get a chance to learn about uh, the creative writer's perspective on folklore and the folklorist negotiations and stance on folklore, I would want to give you a glimpse into her life, which is uh, again, very inspiring and full of accomplishments. Professor Nandini Sahu is an important voice in contemporary Indian English literature. After having received her doctorate in English literature under the guidance of uh, late Professor Niranjan Mohanty, Professor of English, Vishwa Bharti Shanti Niketan, she has been doing amazing literary uh, uh, work. She's a poet and a creative writer of international repute, has been widely published in India, USA, UK, Italy, Africa, and Pakistan. She has been a meritorious student throughout her, liter uh, her student life and also uh, won several accolades uh, for her later contributions. She received the Shiksha Ratna Puraskar Poesis Award of Honor 2015 and Baudha Creative Writers Award. She's the author editor of more than 20 books. Some of the titles are The Other Voice, a poetry, uh, poetry collection, Recollection as Redemption, Postmodernist Delegation to English Language Teaching, The Silence, a poetry anthology, The Postcolonial Space, Writing the Self and the Nation, Silver Poems on My Lips, Folklore and the Alternative Modernities in two volumes, Sukama and other poems, Subana Rekha, Sita, Dynamics of Children's Literature, Zero Point, Shedding the Metaphors, Selected Poems of Nandini Sahu, Rereading Jayanta Mahapatra, Selected Poems published from New Delhi. And I think the final and the latest one is her collected works. So isn't it amazing that, you know, um, she has got the complete works of Nandini Sahu got ready, but I know that she has amazing potential and she would be uh, churning out more, uh, uh, you know, literary uh, works in future also. Presently, she is a professor of English and former director School of Foreign Languages in Indira Gandhi National Open University, IGNU. Dr. Sahu has designed academic programs, courses on folklore and cultural studies. In the year 2008, she launched PG Diploma in Folk and subsequently introduced an MA in Folk Literature, Children's Literature and American Literature. She has written courses for, uh, course books for Children's Literature and American Literature for Igloo. Her areas of research interests cover Indian Literature, New Literatures, Folklore and Culture Studies, American Literature, Critical Theory and Indian Knowledge Systems. She is the Chief Editor, Founder Editor of Interdisciplinary Journal of Literature and Langwell, IJLN and Panorama Literaria, both biannual peer-reviewed journals in English. Through her unceasing forays in the creative realm, she has gained the favorable attention of discerning critics who have showered in comments on her for works that reveal the promise and hope of a better future for Indian literature infused with indigenous sensibility and many other valuable traits. Friends, we all know that due to the efforts of scholars like Professor Sahu, folklore is no longer about obsolete quaint practices or just music, dance, and cuisine. It has, in fact, turned into a recognized formal discipline of study and is no longer seen as, a, as mere conservation or collecting of traditions. It's rather seen as a radical enterprise which explores the intricate dynamics of folk, its reproduction in the study of a variety of expressive forms. Folklore could also be seen as a discourse of pain and power depending upon its handling. Since times memorial, it has existed as a bridge connecting people of different generations, facilitating the sharing of knowledge and values. It has served as an indicator of resilience, survival, and triumph over adversity, 
for both individuals and communities. It's related to the strengthening of a country's tangible and intangible cultural legacy, which contributes significantly to its identity. It subtly embodies the discourse of protest and gives voice to the deprived. Edward Said accurately describes folk songs as a dispersed body of cultural expression and further voices dominated, displaced, or silenced by the textuality of the text. There have been recent debates related to the need for reform in folklore practices. Therefore, we are eager to hear Professor Sahu's insights on the representation, ideology, and practices that are central to the discipline. Now, without much ado, I would request Professor Nandini Sahu to take over as and when she's ready. Professor Sahu, the stage is all yours, if you can hear me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Is it clear? Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. You are audible. Fine. Fine. Thank you very much, Shiva. I don't know where all you found for so much and you introduced me with so many adjectives. I'm really so scared. I don't know if I'm going to or, you know, or justify what all you said about me. Anyway, I'll try. Uh, and I know you as a good scholar, as a good researcher, so I know that you have been actually doing a lot of research on the kind of things that I have been doing, and yeah, you have critical engagement with folklore and culture that I know. Yeah. Uh, so for today, uh, esteemed principal of uh, the ARSD College and the University of Delhi, uh, and then Mr. Funshuk, he, he talked so nicely about me. Thank you so much. And then Dr. Shiva, and then uh, Ramanujan College, and uh, all the participants sitting in front of me, and all the scholars, the folklorists, the ethnomusicologists, all, everyone out there, uh, a very good afternoon. Uh, well, I have definitely a long term association with Delhi University. I have been uh, participating in many things in Delhi University. I just remember that in 2007, in the Department of Modern Indian Languages, there was this. Uh, international seminar on uh, folk literature in 2007 okay and then they had invited me as a speaker at that time I was new in Igno I had just come from Shantaniketan I, I was just a few months old in Igno when they invited me to deliver a lecture on folk literature and from 2007 till today 2023 I have been uh, visit I, mean, I have visited Delhi University multiple times on several occasions to almost all the colleges to deliver lectures. A lot of people in Delhi University have been so fond of me, so close to me. Recently, the Honorable Vice Chancellor of Delhi University, Professor Yogi Singh, he launched my book in a complete, in a detailed seminar on that story collection, Shedding the Metaphors. It was just a couple of months ago, and I was honored there. And uh, again, in your college, my students are there. Dr. Shivani, she is my student. Dr. Gautam, he has been closely associated with me. So I like, like I feel this is homecoming for me. I don't feel that I'm a stranger. I'm an outsider here. With that mood and that note, I will get back to my uh, discussion today, folklore canon. Well, the previous session was so full of information. Folklore is a very visual thing, right? So for, uh, for folklore, you need to do a lot of field studies. You need to go and meet the real time folklorists. Like if you are working on language deaths, you have to speak to or the, the or speakers of uh, those endangered languages, you have to take their interviews, which I have been doing. So my association with folklore has uh, three dimensions. Uh, the first one is uh, designing and developing academic programs for my university, Indira Gandhi National Open University, which uh, uh, Dr. Shubha Devedi already mentioned, that MA in folk literature that I have designed, and also uh, I have uh, designed this UGC net examination on uh, folk literature. So now folklore is no more uh, something uh, romanticized out there, looking, uh, watching at folklore from a distance, and uh, considering folklore as dance and music, not Ghana, it's not so anymore. Now, folklore research has come in a big way to Indian universities. So we have brought it to our tables. People are actually doing uh, important folklore research and uh, the Western counterparts, uh, the folklorists in the Western uh, countries, uh, they have definitely written a lot of theory books, folk theory books. If you just Google folk theory books, you will find multiple researchers and writers from the Western countries, not from India. But if you come to Indian folklore, it's more of, you know, uh, there is no such, uh, there are no knowledge blanks in India, right? Uh, we do not distinguish the Margi and the Deshi uh, very clearly. Uh, there is no great and little traditions distinctly separate and 
uh, different from each other. In Indian knowledge systems, uh, in the indigenous knowledge systems, the Margi and the Deshi, the folk and the elite, they are rather considered together. They are taken together and they are here to construct, to build Indian literature. If you look at the Indian literary texts, see, for example, you just look at a text like Chenmin, P. Shankar Pillai, a lot of folk elements you will find in that. But again, uh, there is no such Indian folk literature in English. We have an Indian writing in English. We have Indian writing in English translation. But there is no such genre called Indian folk literature in English. So, you know, uh, sometimes I think that why did we never consider to bring Indian folk literature to the university syllabi till date? I think we are the first university where you know 20,000 pages of printed material uh, are uploaded in the EGAN course under our MAFCS, MA in Folklore and Culture Studies. So I was just thinking that we teach British literature, we teach American literature, we teach Australian literature, even Australian indigenous studies. And then we have chapters and chapters on WBS and uh, as a myth maker. But when it comes to our Indian literature, say uh, the Ramayana, there are 300 Ramayans, out of which multiple are folk Ramayans. We have so many folk versions of the Mahabharata. We have so many interesting and important texts in our Indian knowledge systems. But till today, why did we never consider making those a part of our classroom teaching or our research and pedagogy. That big question haunted me. And then I did a need assessment survey. After I participated that seminar in Delhi University in 2007, or even before that, I had started doing a need assessment survey on the need and the requirement of pedagogy and an important academic program on folk literature in our university. And uh, I sent my uh, need assessment survey papers, the, the questionnaire, it was a quantitative data technique and also I converted that to qualitative. Uh, out of 10,000 people who I interviewed, uh, more than 9,005 or 600 people wrote that we need academic programs on Indian folk literature. And that was overwhelming. The response was overwhelming. So in the year 2007, I proposed the CPG Diploma in Folklore and Culture Studies. And then it was launched the next year. When we design a program, we actually write the material. We write, we edit, we prepare the cover designs. It's like writing a book. So that program, uh, the PG Diploma in Folk Literature, it had five courses, like five books, which I prepared within a year. And then slowly I took it as a part of our MA English also, MEG 16, our MA English, in which there are 14,000 students. So the 14,500 students who joined MA English, out of them, 14,000 students have opted for this elective paper, Folk Literature. And I was so encouraged by that. I had a war with the UGC. And subsequently, uh, folklore no more remained an appendix of, uh, of English literature. Uh, we separated folklore from English literature. And we created a completely uh, a separate uh, net examination on folk literature. You can just go to the UGC website and check the syllabus of your folk literature. You will find very detailed uh, folk literature where we are actually talking about indigenous knowledge systems, Indian philosophical thinking. We are talking about Western theorists like, you know, Alan Gundis and now, all of them, Vladimir Prop and Propian theory, and then we are talking about uh, you know, Sandrila folklore, and then how it's Indian counterpart, the Hanchi folklore, all of those things. You know, we have tried to create a very comprehensive syllabus on folk literature for the net examination. And then not just that, the next year I designed uh, this MA in folk literature where the second year courses are uh, very exhaustive. We introduced a whole lot of things in the second year courses and now uh, folklore has become um, you know, a separate discipline and I'm so glad that Dr. Shubha and the team, they are organizing this important uh, refresher course on folk literature, which was really, really required. Usually what happens when there is a refresher or an orientation course in any university, people take one or two sessions or maybe just one lecture they call me or somebody and they have one session on folk literature. But now we see Dr. Shri, you have designed it in a very beautiful manner. You know, I was just looking at the list of speakers. You have taken performatists, taken folklorists, you have taken the theorists like me, I mean, teachers like me, folk 
the teachers and theorists like me and many other and then you have tried to create you know a very comprehensive approach to folk literature and you must take out so maybe a book or a volume or something after this or if you want to get it published please talk to me but now is not the time to talk about that let's get uh, back sorry to interrupt ma'am uh, i just wanted to mention that it was uh, basically our honorable principal professor gyantosh kumar jha's idea it was his uh, vision actually he wanted he really wanted to have a refresher course for two weeks with all the learned scholars artists performers you know together uh, you know in this form and uh, with people like you coming up and supporting us i think it's going really well thank you so much for your kind invitation well fine thank you shiva for telling me so i must congratulate the principal yeah then uh, when uh, she asked me what should be your topic then i said well, let us take a topic which sounds very very contradicting folklore canon in the post structural context now when you talk about the canon the canon is a structure right uh, like uh, canonical writers when they have a universal approach and uh, they are you know uh, in the syllabus of in the syllabi of universities they are taught and, you know a canon is a very very i would say rigid and a very structured term and then folklore is not structured folklore is it has been oral it has been so slowly converted to the written formats and then in the post structural context when we are taking folklore from new historicism towards cultural materialism in the new historicism and the approach thereof uh, we talked about folklore by uh, making it uh, more of an interdisciplinary uh, research now research can be interdisciplinary it can be interdisciplinary it can be transdisciplinary it can be multidisciplinary now in the post structural context folklore becomes a multidisciplinary research the subject of that we look at folklore as from a subject position and also from the position of an object from both the perspective so when we say a uh, canon then i say post structural context i'm actually getting into the danger zone you know i'm taking two contradictory things so i will just try to justify how do i create or how do i attempt to create a canon of folklore from a post structural context For that I'll go step by step. You know, in the contemporary issues and concepts of folklore, uh, uh, let us say that folklore is an upcoming area of research and pedagogy. We are no more romanticizing it. We are no more putting it as a part of our uh, museumization. Uh, it's an upcoming area of research and pedagogy. And this research that today I will be uh, talking with, taking with you, is to try to create a pool of specialized folklorists, uh, and then in the fields of study like uh, teaching and studies like teaching and research departments in colleges and universities, in libraries. You know, now a lot of uh, select. I I go to many selection committees, and I see that uh, uh, out of a uh, hundred uh, candidates, at least fifty to working on indigenous or even knowledge systems this is such a welcome fact and i am so encouraged by that that indian scholars especially in english departments or even i go to interdisciplinary departments to take their selection committees so if you are doing your uh, expertise i mean having an expertise in folk literature probably you can uh, fit into teaching and research departments as teachers and then uh, maybe into libraries many people ask me ma'am if i do folklore what is uh, the possibility of my employment so these things are a bit of important that you can get into universities as teachers as researchers and into libraries and into archives into museums into historical associations into culture councils national centers for arts publishing houses funding agencies and then state and central government institutions who deal with those and then you can get into agriculture rural sociology extension literature medicine and nursing women studies african american studies popular culture and departments of foreign languages and then uh, you can get into those as translators interpreters curators musicologists and then artists performers and many more right now if you want to create a self reliant india atmanirbhar bharat then i think indigenous knowledge systems will help you in a big way so i would be using indigenous knowledge systems and folk literature synonymously so maybe uh, that is my way of approaching folklore uh, you know uh, even uh, the film industry and tv channels uh, they also have high demands for the folklorists folk entrepreneurs are coming up in a big way to uh, to provide you jobs as 
uh, you know, job creators. And uh, uh, with this research and the kind of MA program and the UGC net that I was talking about, we are trying to create, uh, you know, an art, uh, a self-reliant in Atmanirbhar Bharat, where people can be job creators rather than only looking for jobs. Now, if you ask me, uh, define this when you say uh, that people can be independent. Uh, I'm reminded about Foucault's questions and rationality, enlightenment, and violence of knowledge, and then Gayatri Chakraborty Svivak's questions on the voices of the subaltern. And uh, these things are these questions are aptly answered by folklore research by breaking the boundaries between the great and the little. In the beginning itself, I said that in Indian folkloristic, there is no distinction between the great and the little, the Margi and the Deshi. We take both of them uh, synonymously. Uh, like you look at the Shiva Puran, Shiva is narrated in the Sanskritic languages, and Sati, Parvati is narrated in the language of the folk. Uh, so in Indian literature, you will never find a clear distinction between the two. So that is how, you know, the subaltern, when Chakraborty, Gayatri Chakraborty Shivak says that can the subaltern speak, probably this is the answer. Through folklore research, we may like to make the subaltern speak, the tribal literatures, the folk literatures. So Foucault's questions on rationality and enlightenment and the violence of knowledge and Svivak's questions on the voices of the subaltern, they are answered by folklore research by breaking the boundaries between the great and the little, the Margi and the Desi. Folklore problematizes the structural marginalizations, silencing of the oppressed voices, overdetermination in romanticizing histories. You know, sometimes we romanticize history. For example, the, the winner, say Napoleon Bonaparte or Alexander the Great, they were the winners of the world. So they created history. I mean, they made their people write history for them. But then, what will happen to the history of the so called loser? I, I will not use the word loser for anybody, but then coming to uh, you know, the terminologies, there is a loser and there is a winner in a war. So the winner writes or gets history written. Now, what happens to the history of the loser? Uh, probably ethnomusicologists sing their songs. Probably folklorists sing their songs. So in the form of music, in the form of performances, the loser or the weak or the marginalized or the subaltern, they can make history. And I really do not find much of a debate between history and folklore. History is authenticated, it's written, it's documented, and folklore was something oral. Recently, I was reading a research somewhere, uh, uh, an oral uh, performative artist. He says that I think oral literatures are more authentic than written literatures. Uh, and, you know, I found it very interesting. I asked him, uh, how do we say that? And he says that uh, if it is written literature, like this is a book. Okay? So this is a book. So you have written it. This is your point of view. So this is one person's point of view. If it is written history or written document. But if it is folklore, it has always the room for improvisation because it becomes to a people's culture. One person, one generation, they pass the oral culture to the next generation. And then they uh, create that literature or that lore according to the need of the art. Whatever is the requirement and need of their times, they create that kind of oral history. And then the next generation will take the ideas, will take the essence of that text, and then they will create their own text according to the need of their time. So he says that oral literature is more authentic because it is people's culture, because it's people's history, and a lot of people contribute to that not just one person's point of view. When he said that, I was definitely reminded about, again, uh, structuralism and post-structuralism, how in structuralism there is residuity or there is a definitive culture, and in post-structuralism, we, we make it open, we make it public, and then uh, maybe this is a text in progress. So oral literatures are mostly texts in progress, like Walt Whitman would say, that I can write my book every year. One book I will take up, I will write this year, I will write next year, I will write the next. So every year I can write a new version of my own book so that with my evolution as an individual will be reflecting in my book, keeping in view the need of the hour, the time. So folklore is that flexible. Folklore is inclusive. Folklore is flexible because it's people's culture, because it 
dictates the collective imagination of a race or a class or a gender. Uh, and just remind uh, here, I'm reminded when we talk about folklore and gender, you know, uh, in gender studies, we, are, we theorize so much. We talk about first wave, second wave, third wave feminism. We have definitive ideas about like how the first wave feminism was about, uh, uh, say, you know, the, the voting rights of women in the Western and the European countries. And the second wave feminism was about the body and the body politics and the corporeality and, you know, uh, the rights of women to, to terminate uh, their pregnancy. Those things created the second wave and third wave industrial revolution and then coming up of women. Uh, so these are in the first and second and third wave feminism of our written history or documentation. You come to folklore the, and gender studies. Uh, I'm reminded about a text, uh, Gopinath Mohanty's Paraja, where, uh, you know, if you go to that uh, Paraja community, uh, you find that uh, there is so much of gender equality and liberation of women out there. Uh, they have a carnival night where men and women will come forward, young men and women, they will dance together. And then uh, the woman will choose a man. The woman will select a man to go with him. Then they will go to a space provided by the community. They don't have to go to that space discreetly. It is not a clandestine affair. They go to that space openly. Uh, the space is provided by the community, by the Faraja community. And they spend a night or two or three, or they spend some time with the man. And then the woman would decide if she wants to uh, spend the rest of her life with that man. If she doesn't want to do that, she is free to, to come out of it. And then there is no judgment for her. No one is judging. So look at the gender uh, uh, neutral quality or empowerment of women in several folk and tribal communities. And this is not a lie. I'm not telling a tale. This is not a story. This is fact. I have interviewed them. I have spoken to them. In my two decades of folklore research, I have visited many folk communities. I have spoken to so many indigenous communities, their, their practices and all that. And then slowly, I have tried to think about uh, their folk and I have tried to theorize them and then scientifically approach and scientifically present those as, a, as parts of our syllabus and our study material. I am never against teaching Shelley Keats, Byron, or Shakespeare. I have been happily teaching all those British and American literature since, to, since 25 years I'm teaching. But at the same time, I think it's, that it's time that we also talk about uh, the gender equality and uh, you know all these best practices in our Indian knowledge systems in our classrooms. This is one. Now, uh, you go to uh, Holi. Uh, there are so many uh, festivals in uh, different parts of uh, the country where uh, there is one Latimar festival. So women will take a lot. And then on the day of Holi, they will hit their husband uh, or the, uh, the other person, the other gender. They will hit and then, you know, they will show their anger and the man cannot say anything because Holi hai, right? And so here, that's how the woman is empowered to do something of her interest and she wants to communicate something and the culture and the folklore is actually allowing her to do that. And uh, folk forms as protest. It's a part of folk forms as protest. And its counterpart you will find in Russia, if you go to International Women's Day celebration in Russia, you will see that uh, um, uh, there is this uh, carnival, there is a celebration where on the uh, uh, Women's Day uh, carnival, you know, group of women, half of them will dress up as men and another half will dress up as women. And the uh, men People who are dressed up as men or the women who are dressed up as men, they would be kind of behaving, misbehaving or doing you know, those kinds of things with their women. And the women would be just quietly, silently looking at them. And the performance will continue for some, some time. It's a silent protest. No one is giving any judgment. No one is fighting. No one is shouting. The women are not hitting back. But the men folk sitting out there, they will feel that round the year, this is how we make our women feel. So folklore, you know, it's like oxygen and water. You drink a glass of water, you are actually drinking oxygen, but you don't know that you're drinking oxygen. Similarly, folklore research provides you a platform uh, like oxygen and water. You do a lot of things, but you don't pronounce those. You don't say those things. Like if you... You see, you suppose you are fluorescing, in, you're growing, you know, glowing in your life, you're growing very well. So somebody would say, oh, you're doing great. Then they, then they say, tachur. Now, what is that tachur? That's also related to an Indonesian folktale. 
just go to that touch wood folklore of Indonesia. So, you know, we're living folklore. We're living folklore every day. The way we dress up, we eat our indigenous cuisine, the spices, the masala that you use, or our indigenous medicines, you know, Yunani medicines or your Ayurvedic medicines. Or, or so many things that you do in your everyday life, they have a folk connotation. You look at uh, all those, you know, folk music in our folk studio kind of folk musical institutions, and you really love that kind of music. So you listen to folk music, you listen to Carnatic music, you listen to Hindustani classical music, and then, you know, a clear amalgamation of all those musical uh, systems, and then you create your contemporary music. You go to our Indian contemporary music, there are so many movies. Bollywood movies, even you go to Hollywood movies, you see that there is continuous music and contemporary music. The instruments, the musical instruments also, sometimes they're indigenous and sometimes they're contemporary and then a queer amalgamation is created. So what I'm trying to tell you is you really cannot live, uh, you cannot survive without uh, uh, folklore. You know, folklore is all over your lives, our lives and so these kind of researches, these academic programs or the net examinations that you're talking about, we are only trying to create a structure, you know, a very uh, uh, structural uh, idea where we create a proper syllabus, where all these ideas that we have been discussing, we put those in black and white and then we present those to our students. So uh, as I was telling you, the total problematizes though are structural marginalizations, the silencing and oppressed voices, over-determination in romanticizing histories, subjugated knowledge systems, the Dalits and the tribal's epistemic operations. Even Dalit literature and folk literature are very closely connected. When I talk about the theories of folklore, I'll get into that folklore and gender, folklore and anthropology, folklore and Dalit studies, folklore and women's studies, folklore and masculinity studies, folklore and LGBTQ studies, folklore and anthropology, folklore and psychology, you know, so, so many uh, disciplines that are closely associated with uh, folk literature. Sometimes, you know, uh, unfortunately, no discipline claims folklore. And sometimes each, all the disciplines aggressively claim folklore. They are not willing to participate or, you know, exchange ideas with each other. This is not an ideal practice, you know. Uh, folklore can be distributed among so many disciplines. I'm just reminded in this MA in folk literature that I'm talking about, um, there are some students, uh, some of my students are, uh, students are like you, you know, the researchers, the teachers, associate professors, professors from National School of Drama professors are my students. And then some uh, doctors from Safdarjan Hospital and AIMS are also my students in this folk literature program. So we have uh, one uh, um, element, um, component here, which is, uh, you know, this one, um, uh, a project. And then one of my, uh, student C is a doctor in Safdarjan Hospital and, and he did a project on indigenous medical knowledges and uh, how they are influential factors in the contemporary peer-reviewed allopathic medicine. So we, we said that uh, allopathy medicines are peer-reviewed and uh, uh, indigenous medicines are not peer-reviewed. They are just, un they are passing on to unbelief system. He is trying to uh, take it as his research question. Do indigenous medicines only pass on from generation to generation as a belief system or do they have a scientific value system? Can they also become a part of our peer-reviewed medicines? So these kind of things he is talking about. So folklore creates a green culture. Now we are talking about uh, oceanic uh, literature. Yeah, Amitabh Ghosh talks, uh, he talks a lot about ocean literature, the literature of the blue, oceanic humanities, ocean humanities. He talks about then green culture, eco-criticism, eco-feminism. So these kind of things also come under folklore. So folklore is an umbrella term, actually. A lot of things will come under that. As of now, I think I have already given you 40 to 50 disciplines which can come under folklore. Now, I claim that green studies, green culture, native literatures, and uh, then ocean studies, uh, medical humanities, so many things can come under folk literature and even ICT, even digital humanities and ICT, they can also come under folk literature. I will tell you how. So today, uh, I will talk about how folklore creates a green culture through nature and sustainable programs. And my research points will be very, very limited because on each point I would like to uh, discuss more. My research points are folklore research methodologies, then folklore and structuralism, then folklore and post-structuralism, 
and then one point will be post folklore now you talk about uh, uh, folklore but a uh, uh, post folklore is also a very interesting and new area of knowledge which i will i would like to discuss if uh, dr shubha will give me time uh, now another uh, area i would discuss about creation of a folk mind now i think i have a very clear folk mind i have created this folk mind uh, by my 20 years of research and folklore reading and then in anything and everything i try to get a folk connection even when i write poetry like i am a poet i have eight to nine poetry collections and when i wrote my poetry collection sita i read 300 ramayans out of which more than 260 were folk ramayans and when i was you know beaming with ideas about sita reading those folk ramayans and then uh, i read some classical ramayans also and then i read uh, ramayans all over the world india is not only the place for the ramayan there are so many folk ramayans in bali in so many other places you know go to sri lanka go to nepal uh, they have their own versions of the ramayans and i read all of them all the folk ramayans and then i wrote my uh, long poem sita and my long poem karna or my long poem medusa uh, or my recent story collection, Shredding the Metaphors, I think in many of the stories, there are folk references. And I have a poetry collection, Sukama and other poems. So Sukama is a tribal woman with facial tattoos. How her husband had created those facial tattoos on her face to make her ugly so that other men will not look at her. So in all poems I write, actually, uh, I do not like to write uh, uh, blank verse or free verse. I don't like to write free verse. I like to write blank verse. And also very, very rhyming poems with internal rhythm. I really take care of the rhyming and the rhythmical patterns in poetry. I do not understand poetry where the lines do not have a rhyme scheme. So I don't write that. But also, I do not like to write abstract poetry. For me, every poem is a story. If I don't have a story, I will not write a poem. Like one of my poems, Ahelia's Waiting. Ahelia is waiting for Lord Ram to come and redeem her, to touch her. So she is using touch as a metaphor. She is asking the, uh, the archetypal Ram to come and touch her, to complete her. In the process, she would also touch him back and complete him as a man. So a man and a woman will complete each other by touch metaphor. And then she says that you, otherwise you don't have to come and touch me to redeem me from any crime that I never committed. She never committed any crime. Whatever happened to Ahilya is history. Everyone knows it. So she says that I never committed any crime. So you don't have to really touch me to redeem me from a from an uncommitted crime. So that is a, that is a poem. So every poem that I write, a little bit of myth and folklore definitely uh, go, go into that. And uh, as a creative writer, I have been using folklore. And in my classroom teaching, I have been using folk theories as well as in my creative writing, I'm using folk theories. So that's all. And then uh, my next point of research today would be uh, post folklore and then creation of a folk mind. And then I would be talking about the phenomenological and cosmological time in folklore. Now, what do I understand by the phenomenological approach to folklore? The phenomenological approach is a form of qualitative inquiry that emphasizes experiential lived aspects of a particular construct. That is, how the phenomenon is experienced at the time that it occurs, rather than what is thought about this experience or meaning uh, subsequently in future. So, folklore, does it have a past? Does it have a future? Or folklore belongs to any linear time. In folklore, you know, what I understand is in folklore, time is not linear, it's cyclic. Time is cyclic. So I would talk about the synchronous time in folklore, not the asynchronous, but the synchronous time in folklore. That would be one of my areas of uh, discussion today. And then uh, when I say cosmological time in folklore, I mean cosmology deals with the physical situation that the context uh, in large of the human existences or the universe, uh, you know, they influence our research. Like you talk about Anthropocene. Today, everyone is talking about Anthropocene. What is that? How can we take Anthropocene as a part of our uh, folklore research? If I say that anthropologists have contributed in a big way to folk literature, then I'm not exaggerating. There was a time when uh, anthropologists and historians used to claim that literature has done nothing for folklore. Then I took it as a challenge that literature is also doing so much for folklore. So MEG 16, which I have designed as Indian folk literature, where I have taken a whole lot of literary texts, like Nagamandala, Ayavadana, those kind of Giriyas Karnas texts, or 
so many of them you can just look at uh, the the line of the series of uh, story collections poetry collections novels even drama even jatra kathakali tamasha nautanki pala videshiya dandanata all those uh, cultural heritage uh, the systems related to our cultural heritage our indian knowledge systems uh, somehow i have claimed in the flexibility of folklore i was challenged when i proposed that course uh coming all the way from shantiniketan to delhi in the year 2006 uh, 6 when i proposed something in folk folklore coming from the english department i was definitely challenged by the board of studies and uh, they said that why folklore and why english teacher is doing this anthropologists should do it. history people should do it. then i said please do it somebody has to do it if you don't want to do it then let me do it and then i had to go through so many fire tests several times it was rejected several times my course was sent back to me my programs were sent back to me but ultimately uh, i was rather very very determined that i have to take folklore to the table and today here it is uh, this uh, 20000 pages of folk literature material is uh, open access and everyone is reading it and not just that so many foreign universities have invited me to design their ma and ba folk literature programs many universities even in delhi so many universities and colleges have invited me to design their folk literature courses and i'm really glad and i think that uh, coming five years uh, all the indian universities will have a folk literature so folk literature will not be just a part of english literature just one block one unit one chapter it won't be so all the indian universities will take up that's what i feel and uh, folk research it is a scholarly and systematic investigation so you know yes that question which i asked you in the beginning why have we never taken or why had we let us let's make it past why had we never taken folklore as a part of our pedagogy in the classroom maybe because of the absence of the systematic investigation we did not have a system of folklore you know people uh, people sing a folk song and people will dress up in a particular way or people will just deliver a lecture in a seminar or conference and then they will claim that i am a folklorist well this is not helping this will never help anyone if you claim or you want to be a folklorist you have to create a systematic investigation a syllabus and of the traditional beliefs and practice and then uh, if uh, you talk about folklore research you should have the research questions very very clear you have to clearly define your research questions and the areas of interest and then you have to do some literature review when it is folklore research you have to do the literature review what kind of texts should go into it in this ma program i have taken a poem uh, paula richman's collection uh, lakshmana's love everyone has anxieties lakshmana's love you know what happens uh, that lord ram sita uh, and lakshman they come back to ayodhya after the 14 years in forest and then uh, the coronation ceremony is going on and lord ram is seated uh, on the on the throne and then hanuman and the bali and everyone is there and sugriv and everyone is there uh not wali sorry and sugri when hanu and everyone is around and then what happens uh uh nidra devi no lakshman starts laughing lakshman will have a loud laughter that is the poem everyone has anxieties lakshman has laughed when lakshman has a laughter uh everyone has their anxieties so look at the folk poem lord ram is also presented in a demythified manner uh like a folk character or like a like any any other individual lord ram has anxieties he thinks why lakshman is laughing at me does he think that uh, my wife stayed in a forest for so many days and then i took her back he has his anxiety and uh, you know everyone has their own anxiety everyone is thinking uh, that uh, there is some problem so lakshman is laughing at me and then uh, lord ram wants to punish lakshman uh, to behead him he wants to do that and then uh, lakshman uh, you know after that then what happens uh, you know then lakshman says that uh, when i was uh, ready with the coronation ceremony in front of me uh, nidra devi the goddess of sleep was standing and then uh, she was laughing or uh, lakshman laughed because nidra devi came to take away uh the future years of uh, lakshman's wife urmila so urmila waited for lakshman for so many years and then uh, nidra devi had given a boon a blessing to urmila that you will sleep for all these 14 years so that when your husband comes back you will wake up and today when lakshman came back nidra devi comes to return the 14 years of sleep to urmila or to lakshman 
that now Lakshman will sleep for 14 years. And then Lakshman laughs at his own destiny. This is a very loud laughter that look at my destiny. Now I'm here. I have to be with my beautiful wife. And then now I have to sleep for 14 years. So Lakshman is love and everyone has anxieties. So this kind of a poem. Then ultimately what happens, uh, Lord Ram, he, he allows uh, uh, Lakshman to lead a conjugal life and he uh, requests the goddess of sleep that she should go back and she should allow Lakshman and his wife to live a proper conjugal life. So the poem ends there. So you know how in folk poetry, in folk literature, uh, an elitist approach is not given. You know, I would call that... Uh, palace paradigm. There is no palace paradigm. The society, the civilization and human life is not looked at from the palace or from the upper strata of the society, from the kings and queens, from the gods and goddesses. The, the society is not looked at. So this is palace paradigm. Uh, so in folk literature, you problematize palace paradigm. And a common man, Lord Ram is presented as a common man. Sita is presented as a common man, like a tribal community person. So uh, you have to prepare your uh, research methodology that do you like to do a qualitative data technique? You want to do quantitative data technique? Or you want to take only canonical literature? Or you want to take some kind of folk literature? That literature review and the research methodology has to be very clear in your mind. And then field work. Fieldwork is a very fundamental aspect of folklore research, like, like I told you in the beginning, that when we were doing those chapters on, uh, uh, you know, uh, language death, dying languages of uh, the world, initially there were 6 lakh languages and today there are 6,000 languages. So what happened to rest of the languages? You know, they died a natural death due to the lack of, you know, uh, any kind of archiving and documentation. So uh, we did a lot of field work. We went to people to the places. If you are a folklorist, you have to be a people's person. You have to go there. You cannot sit in the ivory tower and do your research like we usually do about uh, the other European literatures. We do not go to Europe to study uh, Shakespeare. We just sit in our study room and read. But if it is folklore, you have to go to the fields. You have Because it's a very, very visual subject. So uh, I took interviews with more than 50 people from different dying language communities. It was a big challenge. You know, people will not agree when you say that yours is a dying language and yours is an endangered language, so you have to actually convince them that it is a dying language and you have to document it. And then there is no structure again. How to document those languages? You just cannot talk to them about what have they eaten or what have they taken, isn't it? So what would you talk? And the best way of making them speak is uh, you ask them to sing a song in their own language. So if they're singing a folk song in their own language and then you ask the meaning of that song and then you create the grammar of that song and then you document it. Then there may be a folk tale. But now I'm working on a project on the forgotten folk tales of India. So there are so many forgotten folk tales. You go to their places, oral tales, you ask them to tell you a story and then ask them the research of the story. You know, the research and you know, the, the, the reference of the story. Once you have documented it, you translate it to English. And translation will play a major role when it is folklore. As I told in the beginning, that there is Indian writing in English, there is Indian literature in English translation, but there is no such genre called uh, Indian folk literature. So you get into a vacuum, you jump into a well, when you get into folklore research, you have nothing there. You have no material there. So you have to create the material. So you have to go to those communities you have to do a lot of field work. You have to go and record their songs and dances. And then you have to create a paradigm of your own. You have to create a shift of the paradigm. Till today, you have studied in a certain manner. You know, a thesis, antithesis, and synthesis manner. Create a research question or a couple of research questions. Apply some literary theory. The theories are also prescribed. Apply some theory and you take out your uh, you know, research outcome. But when it is folklore, probably you start with the research outcome. The research outcome is this is a dying language. How do you prove that? Right? So you have to go there. You have to meet those people. And you have to convince them that only five native speakers are left. I was working on Native American women's folklore for a project. I met so many, I met so many uh, Native American poets, Leslie Merman, Silko Joy, Hair Joy. I had conversations with them. I took interviews with them. And in due course of the interview, 
I got to know that only six to seven speakers are left for a few native American languages. Similar things happened with Kui languages, so many Indian languages, where only last few speakers were left. So me and my couple of my researchers, we created that field work. We went to them, we documented those, and then we used those as a part of our syllabus, as a part of our you know, reading material. So you have to create the reading material. Like when I was going to Shantiniketan, maybe 15 years ago, I used to travel uh, from Kolkata to Bolpur by the train, those local trains where a lot of bold singers will come. Bold git, they will come and sing. Uh, Manar Manush, the idea of the Manar Manush, somebody who is close to your heart. So they will sing those songs. And then uh, I used to pay them some money and then tell them that I'm recording you. I had a recorder. I used to record their songs. Then back home, uh, write down whatever they were singing, then translate that to English, from Bangla to English, sit with some Bengali writer and authenticate the translation and then use that as a part of research. So when it is folklore, it is field work. You just cannot avoid it. You have to sweat. If your sweat and blood will contribute to your folklore research. If you sit in the ivory tower, you can never do folklore research. Then another important thing that you should consider in folklore research is ethical considerations. It's very, very important. Eth ethics, morality, and uh, you know copyright issues. Folklore should have copyright issues. But unfortunately, very few researchers really follow uh, the ethical considerations and the uh, uh, and uh, you know the the kind of uh, judgments that we should be giving us to the original folklorists, we hardly do that because maybe they are not literate like us. Maybe they do not read our research material. Maybe that is the reason why we just take any material from them and we write down and we publish it in our name. A lot of people do that, but can we do that about uh, 30 years Eliot? We cannot do. We cannot take a poem of T. S. Eliot and publish it as my poem. We cannot do it, right? But when it is folk poetry, a lot of people actually do not have ethical considerations. And I would suggest, I would recommend, if you are a folklorist, please have this in your mind that you have to acknowledge the potential impact of your research on the communities that you are studying. Because what you are writing about a community, you go to Andaman and Nicobar Islands, you see there are so many tribal communities, they will not even allow you to, to get into their communities because uh, there was a time when people used to go and interact with them. But then what people did, people would, you know, just videograph them. And their dresses, sometimes they are unclothed. People will just you know, record their bodies, nude bodies. They will judge them. They will post it as a meme or something and then and make jokes out of that. You know, people will make fun of those tribal communities. So slowly they protested and now uh, you really cannot go and meet all the tribal communities of the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. The same happens with, uh, with many other tribal communities that people go and make fun of them, take their material, take their sources and resources and present those as their own research. But if you are a folklorist, I would only recommend that, uh, that you should consider that. And then uh, data collection, which is very important, as I said, just go to places, collect folklore data, which can include oral narratives, songs, rituals, material artifacts on the tangible and the intangible cultural heritages. Now tangible, something that you can hold and touch, isn't it? Something that you can hold. And intangible, the practices, like music gharanas. A musical gharana is there. So taking their cultural heritage forward, they will not allow you to get into their musical gharanas unless they are sure that they are going to get uh, the academic credit. So please consider the data collection and giving the academic credit to the original sources, like I said. And then the informants are also very important. Here I'm reminded, I read a folk literature, uh, well, in Mauritius, I read a collection of folk tales, a hundred folk tales. And the informants were, 99% of them were women. Okay, so they they were uh, from um, they were from Bhojpuri languages. They have created a language Creole, so French and Bhojpuri, two languages they have mixed up in a very interesting manner, and then they have created their own language uh, Creole, and then they were the informants of the folk uh, folk tale collection. But unfortunately, in that uh, acknowledgement of the book, when they had invited me to design their uh, MA folk literature for uh, Mahatma Gandhi University in Mauritius, I read that folklore book, then I didn't see the, the names of the informants mentioned. 
you just come to contemporary india also you see that uh, uh, women uh, are the most important reservoirs of uh, livestock and the women are a major part of the green culture but very few women are actually given the due uh, acknowledgement and the due credit the same happens with folklore as well here i am reminded about a small place of uh, my village in odisha uh, in udayagiri there is a place called samanvita samanvita uniting everybody together samanvita the unity or the uniting whatever it and then uh, it's a, it's an institution of all women 500 women workers are there the owner is a woman and the workers are women uh, the product that they take out they make uh, sarson ka tel you know they make uh, mustard oil and they, they make bajra and you know all those things you know rice very nice basmati rice they make and all women are business uh, people you know they are entrepreneurs and no man is allowed to go there it is someone with them so i come from that kind of a village Uh, when i was a kid there was no electricity in that village but when i grew up when i was doing my graduation in that village when i was writing those sukkama poems the tribal sukka ka maam wala poems when i was writing i went to samanvita and i had an interaction i had a discourse of, with all those women participants and the workers and they are too keen and very very aggressively very very uh, determined that uh, not a single credit should be given to men because once men enter into it there will be no division of labor there will be no proper division of the resources and money so even this kind of uh, communities are there and tribal communities are really going up tribal women are very uh, uh, progressive very independent and you really find solidarity in many tribal communities so you have to do the proper data collection and analysis when it is uh, it is folklore project and then interpretation when you collect some data interpret the folklore data within the cultural and the social context now i cannot interpret the cultural and social context of uh, this uh, russian carnival uh, that i talked about i cannot interpret that in indian context in indian context you will never find any such carnival where all women's performances will be there and women will dress up like men and they will be hitting the other women who are dressed up as men it will not happen in india indian women may not like to do it Indian women may not like to even present it on the stage that I am hitting my husband. Maybe they will not like to do it. They will like to do it in a much more subdued manner. Maybe in a in a more uh, what should I say in a more artistic or a subdued manner, more creative manner. They would like to do. So when you interpret data, you interpret in its cultural and social context. Now, as, as a woman, uh, as a feminist of uh, a third world country, uh, I remember here. that the problems of the first world country women and the problems of the third world country feminists are so different from each other see for example uh in the first world countries the feminists might be talking about uh, the skin color of their women and uh, the the disparities there they might be talking about pleasure in the sexual relationships they might be talking about maths anxiety of women or maybe driving anxiety of women and how you know men folk have talked about the driving anxiety the maths anxiety of women in a more humiliating manner and the women and the feminists do not like it right so they would try to problematize those things but if i go to a rural village in india where women do not really understand anything i'm not talking about delhi just think about a rural village in india where women even don't know what are their rights and then i talk to them about pleasure on the bed or i talk to them about their driving anxiety i'm not making sense so when you interpret data you talk about the cultural and the social context now in india if you go to a rural village and you try to talk to some women as maybe as a folklorist or as a, as a feminist or as an eco feminist you talk to women the first thing is about their economic independence that you are producing half of the food of the house so you should have economic in- independence and you should have a bank account Uh, you should put your money in your own bank account you are working as a domestic help in somebody somebody's house and then your money is going to the bank account of the men folk in the house it should actually come to your account you, maybe you can have a phone where you have your paytm or whatever and you should be able to make your own payments rather than not understanding anything related to the money that you are earning so you know cultural and social context if you talk about indian uh, uh, feminism and then documentation and archiving is another very very important step whatever you do 
document, create an archive. You go to the language archives and uh, you go to your research processes thoroughly. And it includes you create transcriptions, your audio and video recordings, and then create notes. And then you should ensure that your work is well organized and it can be referred in future. Suppose whatever work you are doing, you are not making it peer reviewed or you are not creating a proper data or documentation, probably your research is going to be null and void. No one is going to read about it. So you have to create proper archiving and documentation of your research and then data dissemination. After documentation and archiving, how to disseminate the data, how to pass it on to the next generation. You have to create that data dissemination methodology. This is where digital humanities and post-truth kind of things will come into consideration. Through digital humanities, through post-truth, you can disseminate your folk data. This is how I do it. I use a lot of digital humanities. I use a lot of ICT, information and communication technology. The course material that we have designed, 20,000 pages are open access on the internet. You just go type my name and type EGAN course and folk literature material. You will find it from the EGAN course. So data dissemination through digital humanities is very, very important if you are a folklorist and authentic one, that is. And then cultural sensitivity. Another most important point is cultural sensitivity. You should not, uh, like I said, that if people go to tribal communities, they make fun of them. They laugh at them. They are dressing and their facial tattoos or maybe their facial makeup and whatever. So, you know, cultural sensitivity should definitely be there. And then uh, the one important thing is collaboration. You cannot stand alone. Like T.S. Eliot would say that you have to belong to a tradition. A poet has to belong to a tradition. As a folklorist, I feel that I have to belong to a folk tradition. And to create a folk tradition where I might be the team leader or my I might be a member of the team, I might take all of you as my team members and everyone contributes. Because India is such a vast country with such rich cultural heritages that no one can claim. I can never claim that I know everything of Indian folklore. Maybe I know just 1% of Indian folklore. It is so vast. I know maybe less than 1% of Indian knowledge systems. Every day when I listen to scholars like your people in selection committees, or I listen to people making presentations in seminars and conferences where I go as a keynote speaker or something, I listen to people in that Indian language. The other day, somebody made a presentation on uh, the the effigy and the things written on the trucks. Truck, no, gadi hota na, so trucks. On the back of the truck, a lot of things are Buri Nazar Bala Tera Mukala. And then, you know, a mask is put there. And somebody is uh, doing a book of research in that. I was so amazed. And then the person has actually gone into it. I talked to all those artists who write those things and who create those masks. The person has done that. So, you know, folklore is so varied and everything can actually be taken into folklore from a uh, from the cultural materialism point of view. Not as a new historicist, but as a cultural materialist, you have to take everything into, uh, you know, and the collaboration can enhance the quality and depth of your research. So, you know, you have to be empathetic. You have to think about quality research, sensitivity, empathy, commitment to preserving and understanding the diverse traditions. You know, if I am from Delhi, I have to understand the cultural traditions, the heritages of the rest of the parts of the country. Just that I am a person in Delhi and I do not understand those things and my folk theories will be very, very Western and very European, then probably I'm not going to help it. Now, after talking about uh, how much time I have, Ma'am, you, uh, you can take five minutes and then we can take up some questions. Uh, I think there are okay, some... I'll take, 10, I'll take 10 more minutes. Please give me 10 minutes, right? So now, if you talk, ask me to talk about folklore and structuralism, uh, then I'll go to post-structuralism. Structuralism is a theoretical framework that originated in the field of linguistics, particularly with the uh, work of uh, Saussure, and it was later adapted and applied to various other fields, including anthropology and folk literature. And then... Uh, structuralism talked about binary oppositions, good and evil, black and white, uh, right? And then uh, the, the elementary structures like Lovis Trust, structural study of the myth, that was also one kind of structural research. And Lovis Trust, for example, he proposed that myths are structured as systems of opposing elements like nature versus culture. And what is the difference between myth, uh, mythopoiesy, and mythopoeia and mythopoiesis. You know, uh, the structurals, uh, the structuralists, they talked about only myth. 
they talked about only myth. And the post-structuralists, they talked about mythopoiesis, mythopoia, and mythopoiesy. So, so many other terms came into existence with uh, uh, post-structuralism. I'll come to that during the question and answer session. And the binary oppositions in folklore, they were also a part of uh, the structuralist folklore research. In fairy tales, one can find opposites like good versus evil, you know, in the Cinderella tales. All the sisters are evil and Cinderella is good. And then she she has a pair of shoes and she's waiting for some somebody to come and rescue. So you know, good versus evil. And in the Hanchi folk tales also you find these kind of things. And beauty versus ugliness, you know, and then the youth and old age. And analyzing these binary oppositions can reveal cultural values and themes when it was structural research. And then analogical reasoning, that was also there in structural uh, research. Basically, it dealt with the cohesion and coherence of any given text. And then the challenges and critics of oversimplifying a text. If it is structural approach to a folk text, we are in a way oversimplifying it. The text may have layers like layers of an onion. No? An onion has so many layers, but structurals, they oversimplify the text. And structuralists may go to new historicist approach, whereas post-structuralists, they take up cultural materialism. So the later developments of structuralism and folklore research were they eventually succeeded by uh, post-structuralism and they emphasized the complexities and the ambiguities of the cultural expression. And then uh, they did that by examination of recurring patterns, binary oppositions, underlying structures in myths and legends and folk narratives. However, this is just one of many theoretical lenses through which folklore can be analyzed. The subsequent approaches have expanded the understanding of folklore by considering its broader cultural and contextual dimensions. So this is a you know, structuralist, they kind of looked at the binary oppositions, good and evil, and black and white, you know, beauty and beast. Beauty and beast kind of stories, they came into the folklore and structural research. Now, we belong to the post-structural era. We belong to, we, I think I am a post-structuralist and a folklorist thereof. And I think many of you would agree to that. Now, let me just define in five minutes what is folklore in a post-structural era. Uh, Post-structuralism in a theoretical framework, it's, uh, and it emerged in the mid 20th century, challenging many traditional concepts of canon and authenticity and authority in literature and other fields. In the context of folklore, post-structuralism has uh, had a significant impact on the on the scholars and thinkers, how uh, they approach the idea of a canon. And the idea of a canon is very, very rigid. But post-structuralists looked at uh, a canon in a flexible way. And how did they do that? There are a few points. One is deconstruction of authority. The post-structuralists, they believed in the deconstruction of authority. They rejected the ideas of fixed and authoritative canons. They questioned the notion of a single and universal folklore canon. They highlighted the power dynamics, ideology, and the cultural biases. And then uh, they talked about uh, the unstable signifiers by creating a difference, not a difference, but a difference, R-A-N-C-E, which means they always defer the unstable. Something that is unstable has to be deferred, has to be sent to future. This concept challenged the stability of folkloric texts, narratives, traditions, and it made it difficult to establish the rigid canon. There is not no rigid canon for the post-structuralist. The canon has become, it has become flexible. The canon has become very, very wide and reachable. Now, everyone can reach folklore. Like I'm a person of literature, I can get into folklore so seamlessly. The other A or B or C, they, he is a historian and he is a gender specialist or he is a queer person or the other person is a mathematician. He can get into folk and classical literature through Vaidik Ganit, you know. So anyone and everyone can get into folklore research, even a medicine man. You go to Bali Island, so many medicine men are there who talk about indigenous medicines. And then the role of power in discourse, it was also re-examined, it was re-thought about. And the idea of the panopticon, now literature students, you all are, I think some most of you are from literature, you know the panopticon. Now in the post-structural context in folklore, if the idea of the panopticon comes, who is the center and who is the periphery? is no more rigid. 
if as a folklorist i am sitting here you all are watching me you are judging me or you all are sitting there i am sitting here i know what is happening in folklore research and i am looking at you i am judging you you really don't know. so the idea of the panopticon is no more there in post structuralism because judging and being judged were the ideas of the structuralists and the post structuralists they have kind of dismissed the idea of the panopticon and now the uh, the post structuralists they talk about pluralism and diversity and then they talk about reflexivity and self awareness as a folklorist i am aware where do i stand what kind of contributions i am giving to folklore research i am aware about that and uh, probably uh, the post structuralists they believe more in uh, witness seminars it's a very new term it, it just came to me i was reading and i was so glad to read that you know a witness seminar maybe this is a refresher course otherwise i would have called it a witness seminar a witness seminar is a method of collecting oral history material whereby a number of people connected to an event or topic meet to share recollections of their involvements the results may be recorded videographed edited transcript published as a part of folklore material so there is so much so you know from folklore you give epistemic justice the subaltern will speak people who do not have a voice they will speak folklore is cognitive cognitive and affective folklore is a healing process folklore is redemption folklore is multimediality it has interdisciplinarity it has social epistemology and folklore deals with tangible and intangible heritages folklore deals with academics it it deals with uh, uh, you know the uh, structural analysis symbolic analysis and then anthropology philology romanticism nationalism psychology collective memory which is called nemo culture or memory culture ethnography and ethnomusicology and folklore problematizes the art of subversion it is a cultural expression it deals with environment studies it deals with traditional knowledge and indigenous knowledge systems and it deals with protest literature and then folklore deals with language death from structuralism and post structuralism point of view now before i conclude i'll just take one last minute when i say that uh, uh, myth mythopoeia mythopoetics and mythopoesis you know all those things have been separately taken by the post structuralists that myth is rather should i say a simplistic term and uh, myth has been defined by very many people but when it is mythopoeia it is the method of creating myth like interdisciplinary is looking into a text textually but interdisciplinary investigating one text from the point of view of the other transdisciplinary creating a new direction of reading all those texts from the perspective of each other but multidisciplinary creating a new text after taking all those texts into consideration the creation of a new text so mythopoesis is creation of the new myth by taking all kinds of myths and folklores into consideration creation of a new myth and i would just leave it here uh, just um, maybe we can have a discourse maybe we can have a discussion and uh, yeah sure thank you thank uh, you absolutely enriching ma'am and thank you so much for your passion and your willingness to share so much of knowledge with our participants and you have actually helped us to critically engage with the pedagogical aspect of folklore and uh, got uh, valuable takeaways and i believe that we could have a separate discussion on those many of those uh, uh, ideas and to start with i would say that you have developed a creative response i mean whatever you have talked about a number of things number of uh, ideas that you uh, brought up during your uh, presentation i mean through that i could guess that you know you have uh, sort of developed a very creative response to folklore and it's very organic holistic and it's sort of inclusive all inclusive and uh, i'll i'll just i'll just <laughs> you want to ask too many questions I'm sorry for the interruption. Yeah, so I'm coming back to my uh, first query. Uh, although our participants are equally eager to ask questions, but this is the first thing that I would like to ask. Presently, we see that folk narratives have taken the world by storm. Wherever we see people are, you know, 
uh, delving into this field. So as you mentioned, uh, you know, that mathematicians, uh, be it, uh, you know, uh, people from the medicine or artists, performers, they were the, I mean, the indigenous people who obviously have the first, uh, uh, you know, uh, claim to that field. But a lot of people are, you know, claiming folklore and we are being aware uh, of new truth, you know, new realities every day. So there are the uh, oral stories being told, retold, you know, and uh, where is the truth uh, going away? I mean, that's the question because we see that everyone is constructing truth. They are in a hurry to construct a truth, to give a finality sort of thing. And they are uh, reorganizing their experiences uh, with the reality. So what is your take on that? Being a folklorist, how have you tackled that uh, confusion or sort of, you know? Okay. You know, there is no harm in that. There is no confusion in that. Okay. Uh, if no one would have claimed folklore, then folklore would have become an orphan. Now, if everyone is claiming folklore, let it become everybody's child and everyone can groom the child in their own way. Every department can have their own uh, folklore uh, research. I mm. find no harm in that. Okay, that's wonderful. That's a wonderful approach and very accommodating and very interesting. And uh, what I could see that you have a great passion for literature as well as folklore. In fact, it's very difficult to judge uh, for which you are more passionate. So, and, you, and I've seen that you both these two interests constantly inform each other. So uh, you have used a lot of folk resources in your own poetry and your uh, fiction, as you have also mentioned, and I got a chance to read some of those. So could see that, you know, this, uh, this is wonderful blending of the folklore cultural material and that uh, comes in, seeps in naturally. It's not something incidental or, um, you know, something in the backdrop just to, you know, uh, inside interest or attraction. And it, it just flows naturally. So how do you do that? And how do you, uh, I mean, sort of very ingeniously deal with it? Do you do it consciously or it just comes in? What is? I don't do it consciously. They just come to me. Maybe, maybe I kept on reading. I read a lot every day, some 10 hours I read and um... They just come to me. Uh, as I said, that uh, I cannot write a poem if I don't have a story. Each poem is a story. My Sita is a story. I have taken a complete book, Sita, 25 cantos, mm -hmm. where uh, my Sita is not a brooding, crying, complaining woman who was left alone during pregnancy. Rather, she is an, an optimistic, uh, positive, free-thinking, progressive woman who used time in her stride. She became a teacher in the Almighty Ashram. She was a healer, she was a mother, she was a teacher, she was a great cook, she was a lover. This is everything. So probably they come to me very naturally. And the folklore comes to me like the leaves come to a tree. Wow. I don't drag them by their hair. <laughs> that should be the idea. That's what Keats said about poetry. Right. So that's the idea. Yeah, so uh, at this point, I'll take a few questions and observations from our uh, dear participants who have been patiently waiting. So this is Josa, Dr. Josa from the English Department of ARST College. And she says, thank you uh, for this wonderful session. I've read your poems and waiting to listen to you. My question is, in your view, what is the take of folk literature on the imperfections of human body? As you have written Sukama, the poetry collection and the folk tale flowering tree, where the woman remains in the half human form in the middle of the story, then becomes complete. So how do we read these kinds of stories from a disability perspective? Good, very good. Uh, thank you so much for reading my poems and asking this interesting question. Uh, you look at it from corporeality and body politics. Now, just think what is body politic and what is body politics. And then you look at uh, my characters like Ahilya, Sita, or Sukuma from body politics. Mm. Uh, I think about them like Shubha would say, I look at them as an organic whole. I look at them uh, not just as women who, who have their share of pains and sufferings and sorrows. Rather, I look at them as womenhood. Uh, one of my long poems, uh, The Song of Liberty, in that I have taken a protagonist who has three stages of her life. Uh, the, the early youth, when she didn't understand uh, the complexities of uh, having a body, and I have used the vagina as a metaphor. The second stage when uh, she, she has she has to go through uh, some kind of you know uh, violence in a relationship and then the third stage where she feels as a complete woman so at the end of the poem the woman becomes completely non-judgmental she is not judging the other gender anymore 
in mm. the beginning of the poem she was a very judgmental character she was judging the other gender then slowly in the passage of time she becomes an inclusive non judgmental woman a vagina talking vagina thinking vagina having woman who is not using the vagina as a sword against mm. the society rather she understands her value and worth as a woman so the the, the word vagina is used as a metaphor so probably i try to create those kind of empowered positive optimistic characters who uh, who think that it, the time is over the time is gone where women had to cry my kind of feminism is uh, not fighting for the rights of women but empowering women to such an extent that they don't need protection so probably i i try to create those kind of characters that's a wonderful uh, view so um, i have received one uh, question from one of the participants and she's asking how do we see folklore in a world of technology um, for this they'll have to live out of their natural reserves and uh, don't you think that they will be homogenized too and there'll be a lot of erasures and also as you have mentioned that they will be uh, uh, i mean a uh, lot of discredits also yeah right we already discussed this but i'm glad you asked this question uh, so when uh, there will be a lot of homogenization but then you know uh, don't you think that uh, something is better than nothing we never looked at them we never thought about them we just were in the glory we were basking in the glory of being english literature students reading a lot of english literature now if we are getting into those tribal communities and we are reading their literature trying to document and archive those definitely sometimes uh, we would miss out on a lot of things and definitely we would uh, we would not do justice to the the rich literature that they have so this is what is the job of uh, the duty the responsibility of a folklorist like you or me mm -hmm. that we have to try to do justice to, to their literatures and languages by uh, translation and the use of ict i as i said in the beginning that i use a lot of digital humanities and ict to document and archive the folklore research that i do who doesn't understand digital humanities today everyone does even the youngsters they are sitting on instagram and creating reels so if you do something on on a folk poem or maybe a folk dance or a folk music and create a reel and you post it there mm -hmm. and then you give some modern touch to it maybe some modern narrative to it probably you are passing that folklore to the new generation otherwise they won't have understood this they won't have even known about it mm -hmm. even if we, we cannot give complete 100% justice to or uh, their cultural heritages but should keep on trying isn't mm. yeah okay uh, yeah some interesting uh, inputs i mean uh, you, uh, earlier also you mentioned ts eliot's grand literary tradition so that uh, yeah. brings me to the mythical method of uh, of what ts eliot talks about in his plays and in his poetry also so uh, he talks about a continuous parallelism he says that you know and you uh, just mentioned that you know we have to introduce modernity alongside the folklore so uh, isn't it something like that you know you are uh, talking about the existence of two uh, not exactly uh, you know similar but that yes parallel running streams together you know uh, i think folklore. i saw a question somebody was writing that where do you see folklore in the post truth era yes yes may i yeah yeah please ma'am please okay it's i'm glad you asked this question you know uh, surgery in nekod he talked about uh, folklore in the post truth era for the first time he called it post folklore in the mm -hmm. beginning i had told that i talk about it but i didn't get time mm -hmm. so uh, in the post truth era era we talk about post folklore and uh, while trying to we do it while trying to denote the urban folk traditions that mm -hmm. create their own texts subtext and contexts actively in oral and written forms in equal proportions like i said that somebody was working on a folk on the on a text written on the trucks on the vehicles so in the post truth era a lot of things are written uh, and somebody is trying to do such research and as a cultural product post folklore it represents a combination of urban mass culture created by professionals for solo and oral traditions and it is created and curated by urban performers for their own use for example i was just looking at uh, some uh, songs uh, danger chamar songs mm -hmm. i don't know if i should be mentioning here but this danger chamar songs you just google people mm -hmm. uh, folks you know uh, they they come dressed up dressed up in a very glamorous manner mm 
and then they talk about uh, how there was a series of injustice epistemic injustices being done to them from decades from ages and now they have come up they have come out of their cocoons and now they have tried they're trying to create uh, a group of people who can be called danger not dangerous they say mm -hmm. danger chamar so i am such a danger person they say okay mm -hmm. so you know english without grammar if you say i am a very danger person and then they create a folk music out of that it's such interesting songs uh, i see there uh, they talk about how uh, people have uh, you know, marginalized their subverted them as a as a so called lower caste of the society and so called tribes and so called chamars and all that and now they are empowered people they have all those expensive bullets bikes and all and they are dressed up very glamorously and they are now they are out to take it in their stride to take the society in their stride so i saw that those danger chamar songs and there are so many varieties of songs we look at uh, sambalpuri uh, songs of western odisha uh, their language was uh, not considered as mainstream odia till a certain extent to a certain point and today they are writing such interesting post truth sambalpuri music songs mm -hmm. and uh, padmasri haldar nag he has written thousands and thousands of folk songs from western odisha he received padmasri he mm -hmm. cannot speak english hindi odia nothing he cannot speak he can only speak that western odisha wala odia and then now we have given him the country has the government of india has given him the padmasri and then his poetry is being translated and then i have taken a part of his poetry in my in my mf folklore so this is how well in the post truth period post folklore is going to work post folklore is actually working and then uh, you know as a cultural product post folklore represents a combination of urban mass culture uh created by professionals uh for solo uh, oral traditions maybe this is how uh i'm just reminded here that panini he did not interpret the grammar of the ramayana and the mahabharata he considered these two as absolute texts panini he said that if our ramayana and mahabharata grammar i will not touch them and then uh, i would like to apply the same theory to the folk ramayans and the folk mahabharats and the folk texts the grammar of the folk text like when i said danger chamar so please don't consider the grammar there look at look at the spirit when somebody says that i am a danger chamar you marginalized me for so many years now i am empowered i am going to do what i like so how can you look at their grammar so like nirmal verma please allow me to conclude that we have to carry only that much of history with us that uh, the present can contextualize and utilize do not carry too much of history with you sometimes you have to unlearn you learn so much sometimes you have to clear the hard disk of your brain isn't it unlearn a few things and then try to get new researches into that and folklore definitely is a new research thank you so much for answering to that query ma'am what happened somebody is writing about the trucks I, yeah. <laughs> i i had been to pakistan yeah. and i saw so many trucks yes somebody has written about the research and the folklore research on the trucks you know a few years ago i had been to pakistan i went to the qaid e azam university they had invited me to deliver a few lectures on indian literature mm -hmm. and then i saw so many trucks in pakistan and the trucks were like dulhan for them a man will buy a pair of earrings jhumki for his wife and he will buy a pair of jhumki for the truck at mm -hmm. a time So they are so fascinated by their trucks, and the trucks had so many things written on them in Urdu. And I was asking one professor from the Kaida Azam University to translate those things for me. And then I try to use those as a part of South Asian folklore, South Asian mm -hmm. folklore, and the the graffiti, the things written on the trucks and the vehicles. I was thinking about that. Yes. Thank you so much, ma'am. Actually, there are many more comments coming up. and i could yes. i wish i could read all of them and they have praised you and they really liked the lecture they have got a lot to learn uh, learn from your uh, deliberation and this brings me to the close of the session i would like to now uh, formally uh, extend uh, a word of thanks to you so this is uh, has been a great session overall so it was delightful listening to your meticulously researched lecture uh, and your passion commitment and dedication to folklore are truly contagious and evident in so many ways 
you have a very impressive ability to engage uh, uh, with the participants and simplify difficult ideas. And you seamlessly blended historical cultural context with contemporary relevance. And we look forward to witnessing the impact of your work and the continued growth of folklore studies under your expert guidance. And we wish you much more creative effervescence, glory in the future, as you in your distinctive style engage with pertinent issues. And with this, I would also like to, uh, I also take this opportunity to thank our Honorable Principal, Professor Gyantosh Kumar Jha for providing this wonderful opportunity to meet uh, great scholars and uh, learned professors from different universities and colleges of the nation. And uh, that has given us uh, a chance to upgrade our knowledge. And uh, with this, I would also like to thank uh, the coordinator and uh, convener of this refresher, Professor Vinita Tulli, co-convener, Dr. Anjali Gupta, and the ever active, ever attentive technical team, Mr. Amit and Mr. Abed, Mr. Barun, and all our dear participants who have been patiently listening to us and engaging with the important ideas that are being uh, con con continuously being uh, raised by the speakers as well as uh, the moderators. So we appreciate everyone's involvement. And I wish everyone a good day ahead. And uh, I believe that the next speaker for the next session is already with us. So on this note, I take my leave. And thank you once again, uh, Professor Nandi Saho, for accepting our invitation and for doing this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.